On March 22nd, 2024, four masked men wielding automatic weapons opened fire on concert goers at the Crocus City Hall outside of Moscow, Russia. They then set the concert hall on fire. At least 139 people were killed in the brutal terrorist attack with more than 180 injured. The Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attack and media reports indicated that the attackers were Tajikistan nationals. This suggests that the Islamic State's recent efforts to radicalize and recruit Central Asians for transnational attacks needs to be taken seriously as a deadly threat. I'm Shannon Tiazi of The Diplomat, and this is Behind the News. With me today to discuss the horrific attack in Russia and ISKP's transnational ambitions is Lucas Weber, the co-founder and editor of MilitantWire.com. Lucas, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Lucas, let's start with the basic question. Why is Russia a target for the Islamic State? Uh, Russia occupies an important position uh, in the uh, lore of the global jihadist movement. Uh, and this, uh, it really had a, a key role to play in the birth of this movement in the uh, late 1980s, which emerged and uh, 2000 or uh, 1990s. And um, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan really prompted this uh, rising vision of a global jihadist movement. And the Islamic State actually has uh, roots uh, in this context. So its uh, founder, its founding father, Zarqawi, he arrived in Afghanistan, spent some time there around the time of the Soviet withdrawal or after shortly afterwards. And he eventually uh, relocated to Iraq uh, to carry out an insurgency with his network against uh, the Americans during the invasion. And uh, with the birth of um, the Islamic State, uh, the physical caliphate in 2014, Russia was named as a top enemy, a priority target for the Islamic State by then Caliph Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And it is uh, it has been described since as the kind of leader of what it calls the Crusader East. And uh, its status as a priority enemy was only heightened once again with the military intervention in Syria to support the Assad government, its various military and PMC interventions since uh, in the Sahel and across Africa. And uh, more recently, the Islamic State's Afghan branch, uh, which also operates in Pakistan, um, it has uh, really focused increasingly on uh, Taliban-Russian relations and how these are strengthening. It has used this to uh, delegitimize the Taliban as a religious and political authority uh, while also using it to demonize Russia, appeal to Central Asians, uh, appeal to um, radicals living inside Russia. And we were really seeing a, a, uh, a large payout from this because it has rolled out a Russian language media wing, Tajik and Uzbek language media wings, and it has customized its messaging to each of these populations regionally and diasporas abroad in the West. And it has really become a uh, an increasingly ambitious branch in terms of propaganda, which it produces propaganda in more languages than any other branch since the networks in Iraq and Syria at the height of the caliphate. Uh, and this includes uh, Russian, Tajik, and Uzbek. So it's become a, a real transnational threat, not only to the West, but to Russian Central Asia as well. Yeah, you've written about this for us before, about how um, the Islamic State's Afghan branch, uh, ISKP, is really targeting Central Asians and its recruiting. Is this a case of sort of convenience? Um, because, of course, Afghanistan shares borders with several Central Asian countries, um, and it might be tactically easier to reach those audiences. Uh, or is it just that they see Central Asia as a fertile potential recruiting ground, um, regardless of the fact that Islamic State's major territory holdings right now, um, if we can speak of any at all at this point, are in Afghanistan. Yes, well, I think there's been a number of uh, structural shifts, which has uh, opened up opportunity for the Afghan branch. And this includes um, during the height of the caliphate in Iraq and Syria, uh, per capita, and this was a, a small amount, and we should be careful due to the stigma and uh, the aftermath of uh, Russia blaming Tajikistan and uh, the stigma towards foreign workers from Central Asia and so on. Um, but what has happened is that these uh, it's become much harder to reach Syria and Iraq uh, and to join the ranks of these groups. Uh, and also, um, 
Afghanistan's proximity, in addition to it uh, rolling out Tajik and Uzbek language propaganda. Uh, so it's been these structural shifts with its uh, internal organizational policies and uh, where it's putting its resources. The proximity of Afghanistan, the regionalization, the outreach to uh, Central Asia, and the custom messaging to Central Asians, these all factor into it. And I think that Russia's proximity, its relations to uh, Central Asian states in which uh, these radicals have grievances with and it's tapping into this. And it's also uh, asserting itself as the most bellicose force and it's uh, contrasting itself with say uh, the Tajik Taliban and it's making outreach to them, the Turkestan Islamic Party, uh, Uz various Uzbek elements uh, descended from the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan and other groups in saying uh, you can't attack your priority enemies as you're allied with the Taliban and they're uh, focusing on uh, economic development and growing foreign relations with these states, with China, with Russia. But uh, if you look at our actions, our words, we're uh, the only vehicle in the region available to you to uh, inflict harm upon the uh, uh, governments of Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Russia, and so on. So this is very... Uh, very potent messaging. It's tapping into these uh, gr deep grievances. It's uh, expanding its narratives, uh, becoming more nuanced in its criticisms against Russia, Central Asian states, which appeals to these elements that may have been attracted to the Iraq and Syria branch before, but now see uh, the Afghan branch rising as an internationally minded force that is similar in spirit to uh, the uh, the, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria at the height of the caliphate were, it really became multilingual and uh, it held up uh, martyrs of similar backgrounds to speak to specific ethno-linguistic groups of uh, various eth uh, national backgrounds. And this is, uh, they're really finding traction on this front. Um so obviously there's a major push as we've been discussing to recruit and radicalize um, various ethnic groups, particularly in Central Asia. But operationally, how much of a connection would there be between um, the Afghan branch of the Islamic State or central leadership there in planning or funding something like the Crocus City Hall terror attack? Now, obviously, we don't know much about the attack at this point, but maybe you can speak to what we've seen previously. Um, how involved are ISKP leaders in actually executing something like this? Uh, well, if we look at communication networks and fundraising networks, uh, we did an investigation. I did this with uh, Leith al uh with Intel Onyx, and uh, we looked at um, a financial network that uh, stretched from Afghanistan into Central Asia, into Russia, and to detention camps in Syria where IS families uh, are being held. And this uh, financial network uh, not only provided uh, food and necessities for these uh, communities, the former IS families being held in Syria, but it also uh, went the other way and it helped fund and um, purchase weapons and other equipment for IS fighters in Afghanistan. And this was a Tajik and Russian language network, which was very transnational. And it's very possible that the operational and logistical networks um, took a similar route and was involved in this actual network due to the kind of established infrastructure it would uh, enable them to exploit. Do you think that an attack like this is going to increase the pressure on um, Afghanistan's current government, the Taliban, to do more to root out the Islamic State? Now, Russia seems more interested in um, trying to blame Ukraine than addressing the Islamic State. But as you mentioned, we've seen an increase in anti-Central Asian sentiment in Russia, um, but we haven't seen much about the core piece of the Islamic State and how Russia is going to address that. Yes, well, I think this issue also speaks to why the attack happened. So uh, Russia's uh, security, military, and intelligence uh, resources, its apparatus spread very thin, and um, what we're seeing, for instance, is that Russia is already fighting the Islamic State uh, to various degrees and for various re reasons, maybe not even to degrade them. And a number of conflict theaters, uh, such as Syria and in Africa, 
Um, this is uh, influence expansion and uh, propping up its allies, of course. But this has uh, really created grievances from these groups. But I think uh, this also plays into uh, why the Islamic State chose to attack Russia and why now. And the Islamic State's propaganda even points this out. So they celebrated the Russian invasion of Afghanistan in a very long article in its voice, of course, on magazine. And it celebrated the kind of mutual destruction and how entangled Russia is becoming, how it's uh, consuming their resources, leading to a very high casualty count amongst its military and population. And then also the fact that uh, tensions are rising and risk of a direct war with the West is increasing. So um, I think that not only is this grievances growing against the Russian state, um, but also it saw a window of opportunity with uh, gaps in security coverage, given how its resources are spread thin and uh, result in deficiencies in its uh, intelligence and uh, security coverage, essentially. So it, it's it, uh, the Islamic State is very clever in collecting uh, intelligence and strategizing. And it really exploited these uh, gaps in this instance. Lucas, thank you so much for talking us through um, some of the implications of this attack and what it tells us about ISKP. I appreciate your time. Thank you to everyone at home for joining in. Please subscribe to The Diplomat if you would like to see more videos like this. And we hope to see you next time on Behind the News.